investment analysis, recommendations and actions. Here we have three standards, diligence and reasonable basis, communication with clients and prospective clients, and record retention. This is extremely important because what we will study here is at the heart of the investment management process. You will also see a lot of overlap between the material that we see here in standards 5a, b and c and the material that you have seen earlier. Again, I will put this standard in context. As a quick recap, we've talked about four standards. The first one is professionalism. Then second was integrity of capital markets. The third was duties to clients. And then the fourth was duties to the employer. If you notice investment analysis, recommendations, being diligent, having a reasonable basis, we've already talked about this in the context of professionalism. We've talked about this in the context of duties to clients, but now we are taking a slightly different perspective rather than looking in terms of duties to a particular entity such as an employer or the client or capital markets. Now we are looking in terms of specific actions that need to be considered when we are coming up with recommendations or when we are doing investment analysis. 5A diligence and reasonable basis. Members and candidates must number one, exercise diligence, independence and thoroughness in analyzing investments, making investment recommendations and taking investment actions. Number two, members and candidates must have a reasonable and adequate basis supported by appropriate research and investigation for any investment analysis, recommendation or action. In terms of guidance, let's first define diligence and reasonable basis. The idea is that when making investment decisions or recommendations, we need to base our actions on facts. In fact, we need to base our actions on all relevant available data at the time. When deciding to recommend a particular stock, for example, we need to do the analysis that is relevant. So we need to understand the economic conditions. We need to understand the industry. We need to understand the specifics of the company. If we are doing some technical analysis, then we need to do the appropriate study of the charts and so on. But the point is that all relevant information needs to be understood and studied. And then we have to have a reasonable argument for why we are making a particular recommendation. In simple terms, a lot of the material that we study as part of the CFA program curriculum has to do with this particular point. When making investment recommendations, we should also understand the risks associated with our recommendations. So if you are saying that a particular stock is a good buy, not only do we need to have a view on the potential returns, but we also need to have a view on the risks associated with that particular investment. Next point has to do with using secondary or third party research. As a financial analyst, you might be relying on secondary and third party research. It is your responsibility to ensure that this material is sound. So you need to look at the assumptions that went into the third party research. Was that research performed with adequate rigor? When was that research performed? So if it was performed a year ago, that research might not be relevant anymore. Was that research completely independent and objective? So the moment you use this third party research or secondary research, you in a sense become responsible for ensuring that it is 
trustworthy before you use it in your own recommendations or before you use this material as part of your analysis work. Let's say that you are using third party research and initially you did the due diligence and are convinced that this research is sound, it is relevant and so on. It is also important that on an ongoing basis, you keep verifying that your initial assumptions still hold that the objectivity and the soundness of research is being maintained. Using quantitatively oriented research. This point is very relevant when you are analyzing complicated and sophisticated investment products. Generally, with such instruments, there is heavy reliance on computer based models. It is your responsibility to ensure the soundness of these models. So you need to understand that if these models are predicting expected return numbers and risk numbers, then what is the data on which these models are based? What are the underlying assumptions? What are the formulas and so on? And then you need to determine whether the set of assumptions and data and formulas are still relevant for your analysis. As an example, in the 2007 and 2008 financial crisis, the models being used were not predicting the sorts of losses that actually occurred. So clearly an over reliance on those models caused a lot of damage to the investment industry. So you need to learn from those lessons and make sure you understand the models. Given the complexity of the instruments and models, it might not always be easy to develop a thorough understanding. So what you need to do is a large amount of back testing or in general testing of these models in different scenarios and see how well these models would have worked with data in the past. Again, the key point as with using secondary and third party research is that whenever you are using either third party material or models, you need to be diligent about verifying how good these models are. Next point is developing quantitatively oriented techniques. This is simply taking the previous point to a higher level in the sense that if you are actually involved in creating these models, then you need to be extra diligent in verifying that the models that you are creating are indeed effective. At times you might have a need to use external advisors and sub advisors before engaging these companies or individuals you need to review the advisor's established code of ethics. You need to understand the advisor's compliance and internal control procedures. You need to assess the quality of the published return information related to the advisors and sub advisors. And you need to review your advisor's adherence to stated strategy. For example, if you have an advisor who focuses, who claims to focus on a particular area. You need to verify whether that advisor has indeed focused on that area and the strategy that he is promoting. The last point related to group research and decision making is subtle but important. In the investment management industry, very often decisions are made by a group or a committee. Let's say that you are part of a group that is making a particular investment recommendation. So this is you and here are other people who are part of this group. Now, say that this group comes up with a recommendation and you do not quite agree with that recommendation. Should you disassociate yourself from this report? Should you say that you don't want your name published on the report? The response to that is that even though you might not agree with the final recommendation, but as long as you believe that the research is sound and that there has been proper diligence and there is reasonable basis for the recommendation, even though you might not agree with the final recommendation, 
but if there is diligence and there is reasonable basis then it is appropriate for you to have your name on that particular report coming now to recommended procedures for compliance firms should establish a policy that research reports must have reasonable and adequate basis now earlier i talked about a group coming up with a recommendation ideally there should either be a supervisor who reviews this recommendation or a review committee that studies the recommendation and ensures that there has indeed been diligence and reasonable basis only after this should the report be circulated to the outside world there should be written guidance for analysts and that includes research analysts investment analysts supervisory analysts as well as the review committee and these written guidelines should establish the due diligence procedures for judging whether a particular recommendation has a reasonable and adequate basis there needs to be a criteria for assessing the quality of research if this criteria is defined then it becomes easier for the review committee or the review supervisor to determine whether it is acceptable for a particular report to be circulated there needs to be detailed written guidance for testing of all computer based models so this connects with the items that we talked about earlier in terms of using or developing quantitatively oriented techniques clearly these techniques or the quantitative models have to be rigorously tested and only if they pass those tests should they be used firms should have measurable criteria for assessing outside providers this connects with the use of secondary or third party research so clearly certain measurable criteria need to be met before secondary or third party research is used as part of the investment process at your firm and there also needs to be criteria for evaluating external advisors that connects with this particular point standard 5b communication with clients and prospective clients members and candidates must disclose to clients and prospective clients the basic format and general principles of the investment processes they use to analyze investments select securities and construct portfolios and must promptly disclose any changes that might materially affect those processes number 2 members and candidates must disclose to clients and prospective clients significant limitations and risks associated with the investment process number 3 members and candidates must use reasonable judgment in identifying which factors are important to their investment analyses recommendations or actions and include those factors in communications with clients and prospective clients and number 4 members and candidates must distinguish between fact and opinion in the presentation of investment analyses and recommendations in terms of guidance the first point is that you must inform clients of the investment process simply telling the client your decision or the last part of the process is not enough in simple terms and language that your client can understand you need to define or you need to explain how you come up with your recommendations if you follow a particular process and decide to make some changes to that process which you feel might be of interest to the client then you should also inform the client about the changes in your process because that might impact the client's decision about whether to keep working with you 
If you are using outside advisors, external advisors or sub advisors, then you also need to inform your clients of the advisors you are using and the special expertise that you get from these advisors. The communication with clients and prospective clients can take many different forms. You could either have in-person meetings or you could explain your process on a phone call. You could explain the process in writing through an email. The appropriate communication depends on the context and your relationship with the client and the type of process that you are trying to explain. Identifying risks and limitations. Whenever you describe your process, you need to also describe the risks and limitations associated with the investment process. For example, if you are expressing an opinion about a particular investment product that has only been in existence for two years and your research and analysis is then based on two years worth of empirical data, that in of itself is a limitation that needs to be clearly communicated. You also need to make clear that if this particular investment is heavily correlated with the market, then the risk of the investment going down when the market goes down is also high. So the limitations and the risks associated with the investment and the process need to be clearly outlined. Report presentation. Once you have your recommendation, the report that you present needs to clearly show your assumptions, your arguments and what information you have heavily relied on in order to come up with your recommendation. This will give the reader of your report an opportunity to challenge either your assumptions or your thought process and possibly your conclusions. So. It is important to present as much information as you feel will be useful to the reader in evaluating your work. The last point is particularly important where you as an analyst must distinguish between facts and opinions when you present your reports. Just as a simple example, let's say that you are recommending a particular stock because you believe that certain new regulation which hasn't been enacted yet but you are expecting it to be enacted will be beneficial for that particular stock. Now the fact that this legislation will be enacted might be your opinion and it needs to be made clear that this indeed is your opinion. If you are stating that over the last three quarters the earnings numbers for a particular company were so and so then that clearly is a fact. So whenever you communicate information make sure you are clear in distinguishing between facts and opinions. Given the diversity of potential clients and the diversity of investments based on which you are coming up with research reports or recommendations. There are no formal procedures for compliance outlined in the curriculum because the specific procedures will depend on a case by case basis. So the procedures will depend on the nature of the client, the level of the client, the level of sophistication of the client, as well as the nature of the investment that you are analyzing. However, a general point would be that when you come up with your report, whatever underlying data you are using needs to be documented so that if somebody wants to challenge the underlying data or underlying assumptions, you have that information documented and can present it if necessary. 5C record retention, members and candidates must develop and maintain appropriate records to support their investment analyses, recommendations, actions and other investment related communications with clients and prospective clients. This is fairly self-evident. So there isn't too much guidance, just a few basic points. 
The first has to do with new media records. Given how quickly social media platforms such as Facebook and Twitter are spreading and the fact that as an investment analyst, you might be relying on these social media platforms. For example, your recommendation on a particular company might partly be based on the posts on that company's Facebook page or might be based on tweets by senior management at that particular company. Even though the formal rules and regulations on how to use this information might not be available at your company, but it is still your responsibility to retain those records and in your research reports, you need to identify that you are also using this particular information. The next point is that you need to recognize that since you are employed by your firm and you are collecting information while doing research for your firm or at your firm, the records that you collect are the property of the firm. This means that when you decide to leave the firm and go somewhere else, you cannot say that I compiled all these records and therefore they belong to me. Again, the records are the property of the firm. If you want to take those records with you, you need to get written permission from your firm. And finally, the country or the jurisdiction where you operate might have certain rules and regulations about how much data needs to be retained. A given country might say that all data used between now and the last five years needs to be retained. That then becomes a law that you need to follow. In terms of recommended procedures, a high level point is that generally the responsibility to maintain records that support investment actions falls within the firm rather than the individual. Having said that, obviously the firm is made up of individuals and when you are performing a particular investment research, the onus is also on you to make sure that you document all the relevant information. Only if you and other analysts are documenting the information that you are using, only then will the firm be able to fulfill its responsibility of documenting overall records. It would also be useful if the firm has formal processes and procedures and provides the necessary technology based environment to facilitate the retention of records and if those procedures are in place, you should follow them. If they are not in place, then you should encourage your firm to adopt those procedures. That is it in terms of standard five. And as always, I want you to work through the examples.